shall begin proceedings by inviting the right reverend Asantentri to lead us in prayer. Ever living God, 
today, 24th May 2016, revives in us the nation Ghana, the continent Africa, and the whole world, memories of Professor Albert Kwajo Adubuahi. Ten years have passed since he departed from this life, yet we we'll still have fresh memories of the happiness the jokes, the pain we share when he lived, when he talked, when he walked amongst us. Today, though the bitter grief has softened a little bit, some pain abides. For the place where he once stood 74 years ago, in the family, in the academia, and the major role he played in nation building, in politics, the rule of law, democracy, is still empty, but the links of love and longing cannot break. And so, good Lord, let us see him now in today's activities and the various programs by the distinguished speakers and the launch of the Adubuahin Foundation. And we do so with the eye of memory. His faults forgiving and his virtues grow larger and everlasting. His legacy continues to live amongst us. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. My name is Ebo Daniel. I bring greetings from Tema, where I have relocated since losing my job at Legon to retirement a decade and a half ago. Not to digress any further, to introduce the chair for the day in five minutes is not an easy assignment. Available records run into several pages of involvement for which a summary is provided in the program, referring mainly to law teacher and practitioner, international arbitration consultant, chair of the panel of experts for drafting of the Constitution of the Fourth Republic, Kondam president of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, and traditional overlord of Asante Asokore. I might add that the chairman and Professor Edubuain were in school together at Drabin, where they left to go to secondary school, one to Achimota, the other to Mfanspin, to come together again a decade and a half later as teachers at Legon. After Legon, they went their several, several ways attaining dizzy heights in their respective endeavors. On the Legon campus in the 60s, the chairman was easily the best dressed gentleman. He has long divested himself of Western sartorial in favor of what used to come in the prospectus for secondary school as native dress, <laughs> which he wears with elegance. The chairman's easy facility with the spoken word is one more dimension of his persona. At meals in Commonwealth Hall, 
His students used to bring up words they were learning for hearing for the first time. One such word was dichotomy. The chairman does not know this, but to this day, some of his students identify each other by shouting dichot in reference to him. It is how I come to know the word myself. Thank you very much, Nana. We are privileged to have Nana Susubibi Krobia Asante, a man of Asante Sokore, with us. Nana, please permit me to welcome you to the chairman's seat. two of us in this role. The other is Ambassador James Emmanuel Kwejil Agri Orleans, who has more experience with the protocols of correctness. With your permission, Anna Chairman, I wish to invite him to handle the more difficult part of our joint assignment, namely to acknowledge whom we have for company. Mr. Ambassador. Ebo, I thank you very much for giving me some identity. But again, we'd like to welcome all of you. And if we started the program late, it is because of circumstances beyond our control, especially the African weather. You know that in Ghana, when it rains, everything comes to a dead stop. But welcome again. I think we're all going to have a good time because we all have one intent this evening, which is the subject of Professor Edubwahin, a memory of his life which came to an end exactly 10 years ago and what we hope to plan to immortalize him if it is at all possible for human beings to immortal immortalize their human species but we shall be identifying the speakers who are here and um, as they come up to speak, we hope you will also follow our example and give them the necessary acknowledgement. First of all, we'd like to welcome the children of Professor Edubwahin. They have been the spirit behind this evening and let us applaud them for their filial piety. There are three young men and a girl. And um, at the appropriate time, we shall tell you all about them. But they are, they are all here. And you have already had the blessing showered on you through God's representative on earth professor whom you know the one professor who also broke the silence 
which used to emanate from the pulpit. And as Dr. Kujiragri said, it is the providential duty of all who take to the ministry to show that the pulpit is higher than the pew. The pulpit is higher than the pew. We thank you, Reverend MP. And you have already had introduced to you Professor, I, I still call him Professor, although his traditional dignity transcends it all. But I have known him ever since he married a good cousin of mine from Cape Coast. <laughs> the Cape Coast cousins. Well, she was a beautiful girl who went to Mambom and um, she was able to entrap Professor. <laughs> but what is more interesting Abel, which I want to emphasize to you all is that Professor or shall I say Nanasu Subribi of Asokori has been cited by his teacher as one of the exemplary luminaries of Achimota School. And he, he counts him together with Professor Bequin and others in that, in that class. Is it not true? <laughs> but then I came to meet him not only at Ligon, but also at the United Nations. And he had a good reputation of being the working luminary of the law. Working luminary of the law. He was very hard working, always working, doing this and that, and therefore his assignments covered so many areas which you have stated, specified in the brochure you all have. And if you want to know, we thought of him so highly that um, we, we, we nearly got him to go to the International Court of Justice in those days and to be thought of as a good candidate for the International Court of Justice it's not a gossip. It is more than that. It is your reputation which carves a place for you in the gallery of luminaries. And the first person I would recommend here before and commend here before all others catch my eye because we are in something like a a disco atmosphere here. Yeah, you can't see quite brightly. But one person I can see quite brightly is the flag bearer of the NPP, Nana Akufuado. <clears throat> Nana, your presence here comforts us. You, you seem to be losing members of your party, important members of your party, in the last eight weeks, which saddens all of us. And in spite of that, you've come to share this evening with us. And you shall all hear him at the appropriate time when he gives you the flow of his rhetoric. Others will follow and a book will do his bit. But before I sit down, let me once again invite you to 
give an applause to our chairman for the occasion. And by that signal, he has, as a rhetorician, walked up to the podium to give you snippets of his wisdom. <laughs> I leave you here. Thank you. <clears throat> My two very generous introducers, Ambassador and Debo. It's not often that one is introduced by two persons. So I <clears throat> am grateful to you. Honorable Nana Kufuado, Honorable Ministers, State, Honorable Members of Parliament, and Nananam, distinguished ladies of the gen and gentlemen, members of the Edubuan family, and um, <clears throat> the governing council of the Edubuan Foundation. <clears throat> I would like to thank these two gentlemen for their very kind introduction, and I would like to thank the Edubuan family for giving me the honor of chairing this event. I'm delighted with the establishment of this foundation to commemorate my good friend. Uh, since other speakers will address you on our hero's outstanding accomplishments as a scholar and a statesman, I will confine myself to some personal reminiscences about uh, our childhood friendship our subsequent relations and a few of his personal attributes. We met at Asokori Methodist School, not driving. <laughs> the distinction is important because I do lived in Drabin and had to make a round trip of seven miles a day in order to come to Asakura Methodist School, which had the distinction of being the only elementary school with three full departments, infant, junior, and senior. And so all the neighboring towns and villages used to come to Asakura Methodist School, and we were blessed with a very compassionate and inspiring teachers. Some of them, um, J.S. Koba, or were J.S. Koba, um, from Axim, who was the headmaster, who literally ordered me to take the entrance examination to Achimota. In those days, there was no common entrance. You had to have the courage to sit for a particular exam to a particular school. Some of the other teachers were um, J.K. Buafo, father of Samson Buafo, Timothy Ansa, who went to Cambridge, King's College, and actually sang in the famous King's College choir, uh, Ebenezer Adam, who had extraordinary pedagogical skills, and he became a member of Nkrumah's government, minister for Northern Region, and so forth. So we had people teaching us who were themselves very ambitious. There was also Mr. K. A. Ifa, who went to Cambridge and read history there. So they infected us with their enthusiasm for learning. Now, at Asakore Methodist School, as I said, I met Edu in Standard 4. And before Standard 4, you know, one glided through the school and one was referred to as a clever little boy until Edu came to Standard 4. And then you saw 
that there was a difference. One had to sit up and um, we bonded so well. He was a whiz kid in arithmetic. Try as I could, I could never beat him in arithmetic. The Asakura Middle School had a system whereby after an examination, there was a series of salutes. The last 10 would salute the 30, then the next 10 would salute the 20, until you came to the last three, and the two would salute the first person. I recall that I saluted, I do more than he saluted me. <laughs> In those days, there were only about 12 secondary schools in the whole country. There was no university, and there was no secondary school in what is called the northern sector, that is Ashanti, Brangahafo, Northern, Upper, East, and Upper West. So it was an epoch-making event if you were lucky to be admitted to um, one of those schools. Uh, despite our keen scholastic competition, we bonded well together. And um, as Evo told you, we met again. Actually, uh, we would have been two <coughs> classmates again at um, Legon in the history department if I had not had a detour uh, which took me to England on the scholarship. So there was a pattern of ways, uh, but we came together again and taught. And then again, when I, we both were in uh, Accra, Legon respectively, during the early 70s. Now, a few things about his attributes. I, I must say that, you know, when I was a visiting professor at um, Temple University Law School, he arranged for me to give a lecture at UCLA Center for African Studies, where he was a visiting professor, and uh, he was there with Professor Obichere, a Nigerian scholar. Finally, in 1995, when I returned to Ghana, um, we were neighbors at the airport residential area, and of course we met at the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences. His attributes, everybody knows about his affability and accessibility. He had no trace of snobbery. Uh, he teased me that I danced Kitty like a chief. Uh, this was in the early 1970s, so it was quite prophetic. Uh, but I have a theory about his success as a historian. I was very surprised that he read history, knowing his uh, prowess in mathematics. But I think his application of highly scientific methods to establishing historical facts must have accounted for his extraordinary success in history. His sense of mathematical precision and analysis compelled him to exhaust all available evidence before establishing historical facts, checking Western sources against Arab sources and local history. He challenged orthodox theories. That was a trademark in his political career. The second point I would like to make was his intellectual honesty. In the 1970s, as some of you recall, he wrote a radio series on the modern history of Ghana, which were delivered by Professor Ado Fening. Eddie confided in me that some PP members were complaining that part of his series was unduly complimentary to Nkrumah. His answer was that that was the honest truth. As a scholar, he acknowledged the positive things of Nkrumah's regime, 
even if this was necessary, not necessarily palatable to his own political affiliates. The younger generation may know about his famous lecture at the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences that was shattered, quote, the culture of silence in the 1980s. But they may not know that he also boldly denounced a champers coup against Professor Buzia as unnecessary in the early 1970s, uh, thereby earning the nickname Kanau Kanau. And then his deep sense of commitment and dedication. As you may know, he wrote his monumental work on infancy under severe physical stress. And then at the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, he promised to deliver a lecture on the peopling of Ghana. This was before he had any attack of stroke. When he had his first attack of stroke, I, uh, as a committee dealing with this matter at the academy, suggested that he might drop his idea of delivering this lecture. He rebuked me for saying so and said that he would fulfill his promise. But unfortunately, he suffered, he suffered a second attack before this promise could be fulfilled. And then he asked me, Kwajo, did you know something that I did not know? That was his question to me. This leads me to wonder why he made me his classmate of virtually the same age an executor of his first will. So I will return the compliment and ask him, Kojo, did he know something I did not know? I'm sure he would have laughed heartily and added, you quantum piat. <laughs> now, all this is very interesting and Ambassador Grolins has been kind enough to refer to my work in the international arena. I recall two of my favorite missions. In 1968, I was asked to go with a team of representatives from the World Bank and uh, the IFC, National Finance Corporation, and nine private banks to Seoul, Korea, to establish the Korea Development Finance Corporation. It's a project which really um, blossomed into a major industrial development um, uh, facility uh, through which funds were funneled from outside the industrialization of Korea. Now, as you may well guess, 1968, Korea's per capita income was no more than that of Ghana. We know where Korea is, and we know where Ghana is. The other mission which I also enjoyed a lot was during the early 1980s. This time I was working at the UN Center on Transnational Corporations. And when China began to sort of um, liberalize its economies and look towards dealing with transnational corporations and other entities from other countries, it turned to the UNCTC. And um, I can tell you from a quotation in a book, which is attributable to me, that there was virtually no detailed policy or legal infrastructure for the fundamental reform beyond a very rudimentary joint venture law for admitting foreign investment. So the center uh, <clears throat> advised China, together with the others, on all aspects of foreign investment 
and in fact prepared the legal regime for dealing with foreign um, matters. We then embarked on a program of, um, <clears throat> of workshops, particularly on petroleum and mining, international arbitration and joint ventures. So there is China, and you know that China is now out negotiating many African countries. Now this brings me to two questions which I would have discussed with my friend Professor Dubuatin because he went into politics because he was interested in development. One of uh, his children, that's Charles, asked me how we were able to move from a rural environment to our various um, professional and academic activities. That is very simple. Many of you have done that. But when Professor Bedu, who comes, uh, came from Kori, passed away, he was not educated at the Azakori Methodist School. But um, his children came to me to thank me for my role in his funeral. Uh, he was a citizen of Asakore. And one of them asked me, so what went wrong in Ghana? Why haven't we taken off? This is a question I would like to put to my friend and to all of you. Why is it that we can break from a rural environment to high academic and other professional attainments? Why is it that in the abundance of natural resources and the talent that we have, why have we, like Korea, taken off? Thank you very much. Honorable Nana Adodankwa Akufuado, Honorable Members of Parliament, Members of the Diplomatic Corps, Distinguished Friends, Distinguished Guests, Friends of the Media, Ladies and Gentlemen, we shall be hearing the first of our speakers this evening. But again, a little preamble. While we were yet to be on our own as a sovereign nation, history for the UK-based examining boards, bodies, Cambridge, Oxford, or London, history meant European history. The wars fought, who won, who lost, and with what consequences. By the 15th century, however, victors from these wars were looking for new challenges. The Atlantic was one big challenge, exploring which Africa south of the Sahara comes to view. Once contact was made, life-changing interventions by traders, missionaries, and adventurers followed. Reports by returning travelers would confirm for academia the conventional view famously articulated by a certain Trevor Roper, Regius Professor of History at Oxford, that African history could not immediately join the curriculum of any self-respecting university, explaining that besides the activities of Europeans abroad, indigenous texts to illuminate the earlier past lacked, such that the dark continent was no exaggeration, concluding darkly that darkness is not a subject of enlightenment. Such sentiments fed into the Whig ideology of the day, obligating Great Britain to rise to its ordained destiny, which in the words of the ancient and modern Anglican hymnary, was to diffuse light over heathen lands afar where thick darkness broodeth yet, 
Arise, O morning star. Arise and never set. It was how singing from the same page, church and state, or Lambeth and Whitehall, could justify colonialism. It was a duty owed by the civilized world to the heathen abroad, a favor done to the colonized, to the colonized peoples without any known past. I was present at the inaugural lecture of Professor Edubwain at the University of Ghana, which titled Cleo and Nation Building was riddled bullet-like with disagreement with the Trevorupa School of Thought. In any boxing ring, the referee would have had to intervene to stop undue bloodshed. But Vice Chancellor Lezada Kopon merely chuckled, obviously enjoying the one-sided punishment of the common enemy. Like nothing before, the program to graduate students in African history had rolled out as of 1961. The program would enjoy popularity until history has lately fallen on evil days. The complaint is that it lacks job specificity. Some complain. Professor Dubuayin was born on May 24th, Queen Victoria's birthday. Empire Day. He died on May 24, 74 years later. Such consistency in a human being is rare. <laughs> Such was a man we celebrate, a rare individual, no ivory tower dawn, nor any indifferent to goings on in town. For what difference the late professor made to historiography and the community at large we are privileged to have Professor Adofenin, Robert Adofenin, speak to a Dubuahin scholar and statesman. Professor Adofenin has known Professor Edubuahin longest as faculty colleague. Professor Adofenin. And his running mate, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, the family and children of Professor Edubohen, Your Excellencies, Dananum, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I am highly honored by the invitation to share a few recollections of my close association with Professor Dubohain, who for 26 years was my teacher, my colleague, and my mentor. I was admitted to the University of Ghana in the same month that Dr. Dubohain was appointed lecturer in the Department of History. My course of study was BA General Arts degree with modern history, philosophy, and ethics as my subjects. Our paths did not cross until the beginning of the 1960-61 academic year when I switched to the BA Honors History course. For the next three years, I sat at his feet and drank in his words of erudition in the lecture hall in his journal publications and at the department's fortnightly seminars. Adu entered the ivory towers at a time when European scholars were literally on the rampage trying to define Africa out of history. A philosophical movement that emerged in the early 17th century had been spreading the idea that knowledge ought to be based on what is experienced or seen and not on theory. The empiricists, as the adherents were known, maintained that man cannot know anything or consider a proposition meaningful unless it can be established through facts as reported to us by our senses. Knowledge must have connotations of reality or certainty 
and the ultimate test of certainty must be what can be observed. The Enlightenment movement that followed in the 18th century ushered in the so-called New Order. Its advocates believed that direct inspiration or revelation apart, no knowledge can be deemed to be certain except that which is attained by the method of natural science. This postulate was based on the belief that knowledge acquired by the scientific method is demonstrable or verifiable. Having equated knowledge proper with that gained by the method of natural sciences, scholars urged the public not to accept anything by faith. All aspects of life were to be subjected to critical examination in accordance with the scientific way of thinking. Between them, empiricism and the New World Order triggered a change in contemporary historiography. Henceforth, no efforts were spared in attempts to make history scientific. To this end, scholars sought to anchor history to manuscript archives or original documents because they believed those to contain traces that the past had left of itself in the present. Professional history eventually emerged in the 19th century as the scientific, ordered, systematic study of man's past. The second half of the century coincided with an upsurge of racism in Europe, and the effect was to give a growing currency of support for the myth that Africa had no history prior to the coming of Europeans. In 1830, the German philosopher Hegel gave a public lecture in Berlin, in the course of which he stated that Africa was not a historical part of the world. And what was his reason? Simple, Africa had no movement or development to show. In a publication dated 1897-98, entitled Introduction to the Study of History, Langlois and Senebo were emphatic, quote, that the historian works with documents. There is no other thing than documents. No documents, no history, unquote. In 1917, an American scholar, Lowy, taking a cue from his this assertion contemptuously dismissed African history in this statement. Quote, I cannot attach to oral tradition any historical value whatsoever under any conditions whatsoever, unquote. His reason was that the primitive man, African or Indian, lacked a sense of history. In opposing racial integration in the United States about the same time, Professor Henry Garrett noted, quote, over the past 500 years, the history of black Africa is blank. Africans have contributed nothing to civilization. They had no written language, no numerals, no calendar or system of measurement. British historians of the colonial period joined the chorus, writing on British colonial penetration of the Zambezi Valley in the 19th century. Professor Reginald Coupland maintained that until that time, the main body of the Africans, quote, had stayed for untold centuries sunk in barbarism, unquote. A.P. Newson, Professor of Imperial History at the University of London, addressing the Royal African Society in 1922 on the subject, Africa and historical research, argued that Africa cannot have had history before the coming of the Europeans, since, quote, history only begins when men take to writing, unquote. Unfortunately for Africans, 
the only source of information about their continent prior to the coming of Europeans were material remains, languages, and primitive custom. Those sources are of no interest to historians, but to archaeologists, linguists, and anthropologists. Professor Marjorie Perron, echoing Professor Newton, declared in 1951, quote, until the very recent penetration of Europe, the greater part of the continent was without the wheel, the plow, or the transport animal, almost without stone houses or clothes, except for skins. Then the crucial was without writing and so without history. Finally, in 1962, the year before I graduated from the university, Professor Hugh Trevoropa of Oxford University took a swipe at scholars who refer to the African past as history. In a series of television broadcasts on the theme, The Rise of Christian Europe, he described that reference as something of a misnomer. He then proceeded to sneer at the clamor by British university students for the inclusion of African history in their course of study. He declared, I'm quoting, Nowadays, undergraduates demand that they should be taught African history. Perhaps in the future, there will be some African history to teach. But at the present, there is none. There is only the history of Europeans in Africa. The rest is darkness, and darkness is not a subject of history. He continued, history, I believe, it's essentially a form of movement and a purposive movement too. It is not a mere phantasmagoria of changing ships and customs, of battles and conquests, dynasties and usurpations, social forms and social disintegration. History, or rather the study of history, has a purpose. We study it in order to discover how we have come to be where we are, unquote. This was the gauntlet that European historians had for nearly three centuries thrown down to African scholars. It awaited Boahen's generation of emerging African historians in the immediate post-independence era to reply. Edu was one of the small elite of African historians who dared to pick the gauntlet up and answer back. In Ghana, he remained the lone academic researcher in a wilderness of seeming historical amnesia. It is against this background that I attempt an evaluation of his career in academia. Professor Edu Boahin, as we've heard, was born in 24th May 1932, and studied at Osim uh, Methodist School, school uh, Senior School, Asokori, then um, University of Ghana, 1951 to 56. And in June 1956, he graduated with a second class upper division honors in modern history. From 1956 to 1959, he studied at the prestigious School of Oriental and African Studies in London, where under the supervision of Professor Roland Oliver, he successfully completed a research project for the award of the PhD degree in history. In October, uh, on October 1, 1959, at the young age of 29, he took up appointment as the first indigenous Ghanaian lecturer in the Department of History, University of Ghana. As a student of the department from 1960 to 1963, I enjoyed Dr. Dubois' lecture, lectures immensely. He was painstaking in the preparation of his lectures, which he generally formatted in his inimitable style of question and answer. By it, he succeeded more often than not 
in arresting the attention of his class for the entire duration of his lecture. The debate generated, generated by the lecture often continued among students outside the lecture hall. I do never attempt to stifle debate or shy away from it. He had the courage of his conviction and was never afraid to speak his mind. I do always demanded the highest standards of academic performance from his students. For every essay assignment that he gave, he required students to read not less than five recommended books and provide, uh, provide proof of having done so by having their contents amply reflected in the text of their essays. He showed diligence in marking assignments and wrote helpful comments and suggestions on students' scripts that helped them to improve upon their analytical ability and their skill in prose composition. It was, however, in research that Edu distinguished himself as a scholar and left his mark on the sands of time. In a career spanning a little over two decades, he steeped himself in historical research and invested oral tradition and oral history with a respectability that helped make them acceptable to Western scholars as a legitimate source for the reconstruction of the histories of non-literate societies. His research itinerary took him to every nook and corner of Ghana into virtually every ethnic community. In a period of little over 25 years, Edu authored no fewer than 40 publications, comprising 12 books, 10 book chapters, and 18 articles and reviews. Besides these, he had no fewer than seven unpublished and forthcoming articles and book chapters at the time of his passing. The full range of Edu scholarly works can be gleaned from the funeral brochure distributed at his funeral in uh, 2006. Edu had very few peers among pioneer African historians of the 1950s and 60s. What makes his scholarship all the more impressive was the fact that he achieved it amidst a heavy academic, administrative, and social shadow. With the exception of the position of vice chancellor, there was hardly a position of responsibility within the university that Adu did not hold. He held membership and fellowship of several learned bodies, national and international. Between 1969 and 1985, he was in demand worldwide as a visiting professor. And in that capacity, he spent three months at the Australian National University, Canberra, March to June 1969. Four months at the University of Columbia, New York, February to June 1970. Three months at Birmingham University in the United Kingdom, October to December 1975. 15 months at the University of California at Los Angeles, January 1975 to September 1976, and three months at the John Hopkins University, United States of America, 1985. Besides visiting professorships, Edu was also in demand as an external examiner for several universities and examining bodies outside Ghana. Given his unusual rate of productivity, it was not surprising that in less than 11 and a half years, October 1st, 1959 to February 1st, 1971, he rose from the rank of lecturer to that of full professor at the young age of 39 years. Professor Dubuajin had an unshakable belief in history's capacity to provide a greater leverage for nurturing patriotic zeal and national integration. He was fully aware that consciousness of the past alone 
makes the people understand the present. He agreed with Arthur Marwick that without history, man and society alike risk disorientation and a lack of a real sense of identity. He agreed with Cicero that to be ignorant of what happened before you were born is to be forever a child. And he agreed with Levi Strauss that, quote, those who ignore history condemn themselves to not knowing the present. And with Gladstone's caution, woe unto the people who forget their past. Consequently, he wished for every Ghanaian to have a modicum of historical knowledge of his country to prevent Ghana from becoming the living image of a ship adrift on an endless and featureless sea of time with its passengers totally oblivious of their shared identity, goal, and fate. Working in collaboration with the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation, Edu prepared GBC TV schools telecasts in the history of Ghana for the 1969-70 school year. The brochure came complete with notes for the class teacher. The telecasts, comprising a total of 23 programs, ran from 6 October 1969 to 29th May 1970. Running concurrently were weekly evening telecasts of Ghana's history, themed Digging Our Past. I do wrote the scripts with the average Ghanaian in mind. For that particular series of weekly telecasts, I had the honor of playing the role of presenter. They aroused great public interest and contributed to the late afternoon traffic jam as workers, not wanting to miss them, tried to reach home before 5.30 p.m. On October 1, 1985, at the age of 53, and after 26 years of distinguished service to the University of Ghana, Professor Dubuahi retired. In his letter of retirement, dated 6 December 1984, he told the Vice Chancellor, quote, I am going to devote the rest of my working life to writing up the large body of my research material that has been accumulated over the years on such topics as the history of Amphansipim School, the history of Drabin, and above all, completing the general history of Ghana, on which I have been working for some time now." End of quote. I do kept his word and finished the book on Amphansipim and the general history of Ghana, titled Ghana, Evolution and Change before his passing. In recognition of his immense contribution to scholarship at the Department of History in particular, and the University of Ghana at large, the university accorded him the status of Emeritus Professor on 2nd August 1990. In the course of the 1992-93 academic year, the absence of two of the department's most experienced lecturers on sabbatical leave and the sudden death of a third threatened the year's teaching program with serious disruption. A dude then enjoying his retirement needed no prompting to volunteer to teach a course or two to help relieve the pressure. A do bequeathed to Ghana a cohort of quality researchers in history on whom he pinned his hopes for the continuation of the task of reconstructing Ghana's history. Among them were Divine Amenume, John Finn, Kwame Yebu Adeku, Kofi Efrifa, Alfred Ileasu, Arish Kofi Dakwa, and Joseph Ajay. Nearly all of these historians trained abroad on University of Ghana postgraduate scholarships return home to take up appointments at Legon and Cape Coast. The majority of them attained the rank of professor before retiring. At home, 
He took three of his former students under his wings. Francis Agudeka, Irene Kokoi uh, Kwei, and myself, and successfully trained us to earn the PhD degree. Francis went on to become head of departments of history at Cape Coast University, while the latter, better known as Professor Irene Odote, became director of the Institute of African Studies at Legon from 1998 to 2002. My case and that of Mike Okwe exemplify a due snack for identifying talent and helping it to develop to its full potential. I was one of the cohort of six who graduated in 1963 with a second class BA honors upper degree, uh, upper division degree. Having missed the opportunity of a postgraduate scholarship because of my diffidence about my capabilities, I accepted appointments as a history tutor at Oforipayin Secondary School in September 1963. Two years later, I do literally fished for me and personally arranged a com Commonwealth scholarship for me to study for a master's degree at the Australian National University at Canberra. Several months before I graduated, he wrote to urge me to accept appointment in the Department of History. I joined the department in October 1967 and worked under him for 18 years till he retired in 1985. The second person that I do help to induct into academia was Professor Mike Okwe, SY Member of Parliament, Deputy Speaker, and Cabinet Minister in the President Kufo's administration. His letter of recommendation supporting Mr. Okwe's application for appointment as lecturer read in part, quote, politics in Ghana, which came out soon after a champion's overthrow. From that book, I have no doubt at all about Mr. Okwe's analytical powers, his sense of judgment, his industry and dedication to scholarship and to academ academic life. Indeed, soon after launching that book, I advised him really to enter the academic field so that he could make full use of his undoubted academic talents. I'm sure he can be a very stimulating and dedicated lecturer. And so indeed, Mr. Quay turned out to be. A due zeal for scholarship rubbed off on his students and has contributed to the expansion of the bounds of our knowledge of Ghana's history. Today, that knowledge is a far cry from the days of the Ratris, the Mayarowitz, and the WEF wars. When what passed for the history of the Gold Coast was at best the story of the encounters between Asante and Britain, laced with anecdotes of the other uh, the other ethnicities. Thanks to Edu Bohin's pioneering efforts, thanks to his own rich legacy of scholarship, and thanks to the core of historians that he trained, we now have a national history that opens windows onto the political, economic, and cultural experiences of the ancestors of all, or nearly all, of the ethnic groups that make up the rich tapestry of Ghana's nationhood. Thank you all for your attention. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, uh, I am back again. When the Constitution of the Third Republic stood suspended, we did not know what were our rights anymore. When to go to bed or wake up was regulated by an all-night curfew. For not knowing what to say that could be politically incorrect, suddenly the country was engulfed in a deafening silence. It was on the platform of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences that Professor Edu Boahin decided to brave what needed to be said damn the consequences. Subsequently, 
Edu Boahin was elected flag bearer of his party for the first presidential elections of the Fourth Republic. The rest is history, as the cliche goes. But how far freedom of speech goes, consistent with national and everybody's security, remains an abiding inquiry. We are privileged to have Dr. Kwesi Prempe to explore with us the impact of Professor Edu Boyahin's historic and heroic assault on the culture of silence. Dr. Prempe's working life extends to teaching law locally and abroad and consulting on issues of constitutionalism, governance and legal policy and democracy. He has served on the board of the Center for Democratic Development. He has also been Deputy Attorney General. Dr. Prempe. Good evening. I, I hesitated uh, to get up from my seat because I, 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 uh, he said something about Deputy Attorney General, which I have never been. <laughs> I think he, he uh, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Ebo Daniel must be confusing me with uh, Kwame Osei Prempe, who was indeed a Deputy Attorney General. Um, distinguished Chair uh, Nana uh, S.K. Biasante, the Honorable um, Flag Bearer and Vice Presidential Candidate of the MPP, Nana Adodankwa Ekufuado and Dr. Baumia, um, ladies and gentlemen. I think perhaps alone among those who are gathered here today, but almost certainly, I think, among those with whom I have the honor of sharing this podium, I do not have the opportunity, I did not have the opportunity of meeting Professor Edubwahe in person. And it's not by virtue of what you might think. I was, of course, of age, and in fact happened to have been a student at Legon during his tenure as a professor of history at the university. But I did not have the privilege of studying history at the university, something given the benefit of hindsight and subsequent uh, maturity. I would most certainly correct if I had the chance to do it over again. Curiously, I also never encountered Prof in any other capacity during my entire time at Legon. The notoriously self-indulgent insularity of student life in Commonwealth Hall took care of that last bit. I was, however, a very enthusiastic student of history at both the O and A levels, and so was fortunate to have come under the influence of Professor Dubois-Hain's characteristically accessible and popular scholarship at a fairly early age in my intellectual evolution. I remember especially his topics in West African history, which became a Bible of sorts for me and my fellow secondary school classmates as we prepared for our history finals. In the decades since, as I have grown to appreciate the immense value of history, and particularly of our own often politically distorted national historiography, my personal study and collection of Professor Dubois-Hain's history, rich and extensive scholarly outputs, have grown in tandem. My remarks today, however, grow more out of Professor Dubois-Hain's role as a public intellectual rather than his role as an academic historian. Prof, of course, did not see the two roles as necessarily distinct or separate from one another. To the contrary, as a man who had a trained appreciation of the political uses and abuses of history and was deeply committed to assessing, asserting our own indigenous agency in the telling and interpretation of our history, Professor Du Wahin saw the roles of public intellectual and academic historian as essentially different sides of the same coin. He was thus able to move effortlessly between those two roles. To him, the public intellectual's primary charge, namely to speak truth to power, was simply an extension of his calling as an academic. As he was quick to explain in his now famous 
1988 J.B. Duncan Memorial Lectures, it is, in its words, erroneous to think of academics, and I quote, not to think that academics are concerned not only, only with what went wrong, and then these are his words, and not with what is going wrong. To remain silent when things were going wrong in one's society or state affronted Professor Dubois' sense of duty as both a citizen and an academic. Time and again, he demonstrated, as much by action as by word, that he was not concerned merely with writing or interpreting history after the dust had settled. He was just as passionately interested in being an active part of the unfolding national story of stirring his compatriots to join with him in civic action, of playing an influential part in framing and charting the course of contemporary events, and thus of history. Consequently, when he was invited to deliver the 1988 Dankwa Memorial Lectures, Professor Dubois seized the occasion and saw it as his duty to challenge and to break the then pervading culture of silence. That uneasy and nervous quiet, that self-preserving citizen disengagement from the public square, that passivity that had descended upon the nation, including especially upon its middle classes and intellectuals, in reaction to the terror, the repression, the targeted persecution, and the general state of insecurity and despondency of the PNDC years. Today, as we remember and celebrate the life and legacy of Professor Edu Boahim, the dreadful culture of silence, the cloud of fear he boldly broke through in that memorably, uh, memorably, memorably eloquent series of lectures, is indeed history. Today, unlike then, freedom of speech, open expression of opinion and protest, multiple private and independent media, and freedom of association are things Ghanaians can and do in fact take for granted. Government closure or muzzling of independent press houses and newspapers, a fate suffered repeatedly by papers like the Catholic Standard and Mr. Tommy Thompson's Free Press in the days of the culture of silence, is now a thing of the past. And thanks to the legislative initiative of Professor Dubois-Hain's political party in abolishing the criminal libel law in 2001 when it was first elected to office, our jails and police cells no longer play host to journalists and publishers whose public words are deemed offensive by a regime. The culture of silence has indeed given way today to what may be called a culture of loudness. Today, opinion is freely and very loudly expressed. In fact, even the contemporary Akan rendering of democracy in our popular media, Kabima Min Kabiabang, conflates the idea of democracy with the equal right of citizens to speak and comment freely about affairs of state. This opening of the public square, this liberalization of the public airwaves for the vigorous and free expression of diverse opinion is precisely what Professor Dubois demanded. He demanded an end to the course of silence because he believed that without it, without an end to the course of silence, development was not possible. Let us hear him in his own words, I quote, it is my firm belief that no appropriate and effective development of any country can take place, nor can any government be properly kept on its toes or made aware of what is really going on until and unless there is free flow of information of all sorts, free and public discussion of national issues, and free and frank exchange of views at all levels of society. In other words, unless this culture of silence is broken." Unquote. One hears in those words, early if partial soundings of a thesis that Nobel Prize economist Amartya Sen would later develop independently and more comprehensively and articulate very forcefully in his monumentally influential idea of development as freedom. The idea that the expansion of freedom is both the primary end and the primary means of development. In demanding an end to the culture of silence, 
Professor Dubwahi, of course, stressed the instrumental role of political freedom, of freedom of speech notably, in securing development. But the scholar Edubwahi must also no doubt have recognized, as all scholars must, the constitutive role of free speech and discussion, at least to his own calling as an academic. In other words, of freedom as an end in itself. It is no coincidence that the political party he would later lead as presidential candidate as Ghana prepared to return to democratic government in 1992 would choose as its motto, development in freedom. The disappearance of the culture of silence is therefore a most welcome development of our times. But while it is good that repressive silence has given way to expressive voice, and even to loud noise, the riddle that Professor Dubwahin called the Ghanaian Sphinx in, I quote, lectures that broke the culture of silence, which is the subtitle of that book, namely the paradox of a country richly endowed with material and human resources, yet entangled in an ever, ever deepening crisis of underdevelopment, remains far from resolved. In fact, the specific ailments or features of that riddle that Professor Dubwahi highlighted in his Danko Memorial Lectures nearly three decades ago remain with us today. Among them, a huge deficit of probity and accountability manifested in rampant corruption, an absence of social justice and equity manifested in the shameful neglect of rural development and growing class inequality, a justice system that administers justice unfairly between the powerful and the ordinary citizen, between rich and poor, the promotion of sectional interests and agendas above the national, manifested in growing political tribalism, chronism, and nepotism, and the ideological emptiness and visionlessness of our national politics and political discourse. These concerns, familiar to us as descriptive of Ghana today, were the very same concerns that Prof laid bare in his famous lectures in 1988. Why has the disappearance of the culture of silence and the liberalization and expansion of voice not pushed us any closer to resolving the riddle Prof. Dubwahin called the Ghanaian Sphinx? Why has the proliferation and amplification of voice not led to responsive or responsible action to address at least some of the ailments or features of the riddle that Prof identified in his 1988 lectures. What explains our contemporary paradox of voice without good and accountable governance? And as you recall, in his speech, Professor Dubwahin drew a clear connection between voice and development. So why does that gulf persist? Let me proffer a few possible explanations. First, what, we're with, we're, what we are experiencing as voice today, as freedom of speech in contemporary Ghana, is often fleeting, disorganized, and channeled, and unled. It is not voice that coalesces or is mobilized behind an agenda for change. It is voice without any sustained collective action behind it. Indeed, in many respects, the ability to activate and express voice, the ability to vent, on radio, on social media, has substituted for active civic participation. Thus, voice has not translated into civic activism. In short, what voice there is, is not voice that is felt by the responsible state actors in the political class as focused, sustained, and mobilized pressure and as concerted demand for change. It is often a cacophonous voice that merely follows the daily news cycle and moves on just as speedily with it. Second, an important social constituency whose influential voice is not as strongly felt on public affairs as its spending power is felt in the marketplace, and as its voice in fact was felt in times past, comprising the so-called Ghanaian middle class a definitionally fluid and contested category, of course, 
but often considered to include professionals, academics, business owners, corporate managers, civil servants, and others identified by a combination of income, aspiration, and other factors. That voice is missing. The dominant strategy adopted by this segment of Ghanaian society and households is in fact more of exit than voice. With their better than average ability to find and finance their own private solutions to various public problems, today's middle class households have become relatively disengaged from the public square. Preferring to use their superior influence and resourcefulness for self-preservation and the pursuit of personal projects than for civic purpose and public engagement. Some of this is, of course, quite rational, household to household, as those we call middle class, though generally positioned a reasonable distance above the poverty line, face a great deal of economic uncertainty and income instability themselves, and thus inhabit a quite fragile and vulnerable existence on the socioeconomic ladder. Many, too, have their livelihoods insecurely tied to the state or government in one form or another, making them vulnerable to co-optation or gagging and making open expression of critical opinion a risky proposition for them. Though sufficiently independent to engage in public expression of voice, these days frequently do so in limited social media communities or civic activism uh, in limited social media communities venting in cyberspace but still avoiding direct forms of collective action or civic activism to press for change. There are of course a few hopeful signs as recently some of these new social media formations, notably Occupy Ghana and the Citizen Ghana Movement, have pursued more direct forms of civic engagement through organized public protest and court action. On the whole, however, the Ghanaian middle class, a group roughly symbolized or represented at least aspirationally by the once powerful association of professional bodies and its constituent associations, has mainly outsourced the conventional middle class role of primary agents and advocates of social change to their peers who make their livelihoods as leaders of formal civil society organizations, the Imanis, the IEAs, the CDDs, and the, IDEC, the IDECs of our times. And while these CSOs and their leadership have played an important and helpful role in enriching the policy content of public debate and driving some of the agenda setting, their generally, their generally weak ability to reach into and mobilize society, their failure to build and sustain coalitions with various middle class communities of interest, such as the professional associations, their tendency to go solo rather than coalesce with other CSOs around a common agenda or platform for change, and their dependence on spotty external donor support to fund their operations and drive their advocacy have all conspired to weaken their social effectiveness and impact. Thus, despite the growth of formal civil society, or perhaps because of it, we have not witnessed in this generation the rise of public intellectuals of the kind Professor Dubrahin represented in his time. Then there is the matter of the media. There is no clearer evidence of the end of the culture of silence than the current proliferation and pluralism of both print and electronic media in our country. Why has this development not helped to transform the quality of politics and governance in Ghana? Why has the growth and amplification of voice as represented in the expansion and diversity of media outlets not led to greater accountability in the management of public affairs. My good friend, the Ghanaian political scientist, Dr. Amos Animedu, has observed insightfully that we have in Ghana today, what we have in Ghana today is, in this words, the overdevelopment of media and the underdevelopment of journalism. That interesting observation and formulation, I think, helps to answer this last paradox of why the tremendous and impressive growth of media in Ghana, a fact that has earned us the reputation as having one of the freest media in Africa and globally, has not earned us significant governance dividends. Why, despite our free media, are we so poorly governed as a nation? Animedu's insight, as I understand him to say, 
is that the media in and of itself is a passive resource, a technology, so to speak. What matters when it comes to the content, quality, and impact of voice are the critical human resources that control and use that technology. The media owners, the journalists, the opinion commentariats that ply their trade in the media space. And the implication of Animedu's statements that the standards, orientation, ethos, intellectual capacity, and caliber of our journalism and our journalistic class and commentariat have largely have lagged substantially behind the vast opportunities presented by the growth of media. It is hard to disagree with this view of things. The investigative, research, analytic, and editorial capacities of our media houses are generally thin and grossly inadequate. Agenda setting and programming content are typically driven by the daily political news cycle. This, combined with a general tendency to fall on politician newsmakers and their rivals, rather than independent in-house or expert investigation and research to fill in a reported story, has given rise to a binary two-party framing analysis and discussion of almost every reported issue. A tendency made worse by the rather curious but growing lawyerization of most media discussions. The courtroom-like two-party stage debate featuring rival partisans of our two main parties and a nominally neutral journalist as moderator has thus emerged as the standard format of our media-mediated public discourse, a situation that drives out various other legitimate perspectives critical voices and fresh insights, encourages partisan grandstanding and propagandizing, frustrates the development of public consensus, and generally impoverishes the policy content and value of such discussions. Rather than become a resource for keeping the political class and state managers on their toes and pressing for the people's agenda, as Professor Dubuahin I would have liked to see, our media risk becoming a boon for political careerists who have become the biggest happy users of the public platforms our media houses provide. The binary partisan framing of our public discourse, with the media happy to provide a, a casually moderated but supposedly neutral platform for partisans, but no serious independent investigation or analysis of issues, also means that rival voices tend to cancel each other out with truth ultimately rendered relative and reduced to a matter of opinion and subjective belief. Another rather curious fact is that, despite our ubiquitous media, there are still far too many stories and issues of public moment that circulate in the influential journalist accessible grapevine, but never get to see the light of publication. A great deal of news about the affairs of state about goings on in the corridors of power, news of the kind that the public is entitled to know in a democracy is thus kept away from, from it by the very people whose professional duty it is to inform the people. There is then, even in this era of the culture of voice, what is at best residual self-censorship in the media and at worst a troubling betrayal of the journalistic ethos. Of journalists or persons so-called, who may have become agents and clients of the very persons and officers that ought to be the targets and subjects, subjects of their honest investigation and reporting. For these various reasons and many others that I do not have time to elaborate on here, the arrival of the cultural voice, this new era of freedom of speech, while a most welcome and monumental and momentous development, and evidence of significant progress of the kind that Professor Dubuahin fought for has regrettably not produced the hoped for effect and impact on the quality of governance, or for that matter, on advancing the search for a resolution of the riddle our good prof called the Ghanaian Sphinx. Professor Dubuahin's dream then is only half one. The course of silence may be a thing of the past, but seizing the opportunity it creates to mobilize voice and collective action remains an unfinished business. Beyond that, the bigger challenge, namely the perennial crisis of misgovernance and underdevelopment about which Prof spoke with great eloquence and equal passion, 
also continues to stare us starkly in the face. The best tribute we can pay to the memory and legacy of Professor Dubwahin is to carry on where he left off, and that means to work assiduously and collectively to build a Ghana where there is indeed development in freedom for all. Thank you. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we shall have a musical interlude um, to be followed by the launch of the Edubuai Foundation and fundraising auction. Uh, Ambassador Agrolins will take over from here while I look over my notes to ensure that I do not call one more person Deputy Attorney General <laughs> Minero. I'm sorry, Dr. Pempe. <laughs> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, you've just been through a powerful voice, a powerful voice of Mr. Pempe. And we think that it would be harmonious to have also the powerful drums of our cultural dancers. March 1957. A nation was born out of the hellish womb of centuries old injustice by the hungry sailors from thirsty lands. That day, the bone checker buses with inscriptions like We the Go Born Country, Africa, here we come, carried expectant multitudes across the length and breadth of this nation to the old polo grounds. There, we stood in awe and watched as the Union Jack was lowered and the red, gold, green rose with a black star to the first cry of a new nation. God bless our homeland, Ghana. And the thundering proclamation by one Kwame, at long last, Ghana, your beloved country is free forever. Boy, 
by all the two teeth of grandmother's infectious smile the green not celebrate that night ladies in their copper and slate men in their tunabu trousers alongside their punky joes did we not dance the night away to the triumphant melody of E.T. Mensa and the tempo's band we now have freedom Ghana land of freedom Toes of the brave and the sweat of the alibis. Toils of the gift we have got. The gentlemen and ladies in their stilettos and braces who spoke impeccable Oxford English with airs more pristine than the British reclined at the lounges of the Ambassador Hotel to pop champagne and toast to a new nation all hail Ghana. Back in the villages, the moon shone with an extra gleam and mothers sang hopeful songs into the ears of the young. In the coming days and months and years, our hearts beat with pride for we were the first to show that the new African was capable of managing or mismanaging their own affairs. We put our people to work and we worked to build the bridges that connected our minds and hearts and our brothers and sisters who were alien citizens in distant lands. We worked for a school in Gushegu, for a harbor in Takrade, for a dam in Akosombo, for a this year, a that year, this and that here and there. Some say Kwame was a showboy. Some say he was too much of a showboy. That he saw farther than he could ever reach. That he bit more than he could swallow. They say... The once great rainbow that held hope for the nation had become a noose around the neck of the suffocating nation. They say the rainbow noose had to be cut. The era of men in uniform had come. My story is long. The tales about our journey endures. I shall not be able to tell you all of these stories at this sitting. Because today it's not about the history. It is about the historian. One man who helped us to rediscover ourselves and our identities. Today, we sing his praises. Me am free. In Penin so quickly cheap. Mantam Buyafo Sasasia and Sia. Wawran Sasuno. Awra Kokura. Awra Semware. Awra Nancy Docono. Edin Quatun in Sem. A broken temprem. A dressuko. A coffin quinima with Rabu Fino. And a quarter rich about Bokron Kurunga Diana won't quit in a San Campo. Na senia sebe, sajiam, nen kan fofata obetweni, na so tore into ya to ya so, en so fato yufono. Sara, ne ding pa, nen fo ya so, en so fata openyeng pa, okureti pa, esondaye pa, wechasa pa, edriaba pa, amane nche so pa, men hwenya ban fato para ningo. E yinti o koto kro kwenye frada fano fram si fram yirifi ya mpasechi. Ti burukusu, ti brenkese, kwa nkwa nchechirebe. E ye, o penye mpa, awi nti nyeshi emu waha. E du pako, buya fo anentia, waye saa ye saa, ati wananke nuru, ati wamampe nuru, ati wadinche nyinampe nuru, Ati wakwa brafu nuru, ati wakinsi nku nuru, ati wakuntu mpe nuru, ati wapampa krampe kukunrei. Mpire mpire ye shiye mo, na ye se den. Gana mangfu nwe shiye mo wahano. Ebibi mang nwe shiye mo wahano. Amanga mange titiru ufu njinara, nwe shiye mo wahano. Yinti, gana. Adese ma wansu mo binangu bini enya kuya freko toko ma wase tude uro atro jafra me puna lareni ya kontengi na nanoma wodi ya kontone. Ne eti brenkese. Eni eti burukusu, eni eje nte chireche na mwosu wa doto wa wansu la kurokrao, ni ya bibi mankra, wodi ya iye ni nimereti finye goru, ni ya sasa shia shia nshia, wa ya masra wa kuro basa sukosu mwotea sunti ya mfuwa di bigu wamba yura usu bachire mpenye ngofie, ni ya bengfo, abuyafo, akumafo, akamafo, 
ayamafo edimafo ejemafo amatambua fu akufu akukudru fu atakrama pefu awana atakrama pefu bombu de bomata atakrama pefu de atakrama kuri wan atakrama pefu makwa jina mu atakrifa renche medu atrama chafu wose mu wan 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 eno wan wan wi ase afana nyinara ne ano demrekan se akura yemawayeku 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 Yama ma pia fo mo ekronto ma hene wa mo abrao Thank you very much. Thank you. Our team is part of a larger team, and we've embarked on an ambitious project that Prof will be very proud of. We are reenacting the entire history of Ghana from ancient to modern times through a series of spectacular plays. Our first production was by Jackie Stage at the National Theatre last year. This year.